Once again, I'll dust off my TV repairing skills, proving once again that I actually do know what the hell I'm doing. I've got a Toshiba. This one is completely dead. I'll tell you right now, it's not capacitors, it's not the backlight, and it's not the CPU. So what the hell is it? Well, let's do a little bit of troubleshooting and find out what's gone wrong with this. And this is the first. I've never seen this part fail before. Let's check it out. It's a 46 inch. It's a 46 X. V645U 2009 vintage. This is going to be conventional LCD with fluorescent backlight. So no LEDs on this one that would be causing trouble. A whole bunch of screws later, the back should lift off. First things first, we're going to check for some standby voltages and so forth. So I'm just checking it couple different places in the power supply here and um, I don't see any voltage should have even on that well that would be against the uh, hot supply here so I like I don't even have any I got four volts there hmm. I think that's that should be um, I think that's that's the raw side that's a 200 volt so I don't even have my I don't even have my my raw AC from the main rectifier because that should be you know about 180 volts or so on this filter. And uh, I don't have anything. I'm, I haven't even found my standby supply yet. Fuses are not blown. What about on this rectifier here? This is the main the main filter. It's like two volts, right? So yeah, we got an AC problem on this. Let's uh, just take the board out. Take a look. I think if my power is on. Yeah, of course it's on because my power bar was off. That would be off. So um, let's pull the board and just see if there's anything burned on the board. Could be something. Could be a burn connection on the board. Fuses test okay. So first things first. Let's pull the power board and just take a peek at the power board and see if there's anything obvious that's. Uh, that's failed. So I'll do that by first unplugging all the plugs. Make sure that they're all I think they're all keyed. So they only go into a specific, specific plug. Okay, now pop the screws out and hold the board in place. Looks like there's something burned on here. I don't see any. Uh, bulge capacitors hmm. anything obvious on the board Hmm, let's just take a closer look at the board itself. Now the very fact that the filters did not charge up would, is leading me to think that there's something that's not making a connection through on the, uh, the power supply. Fuse doesn't look to be blown, we'll just test it just to make sure it's not open, which it's not. But just the way that these are, are made the main filters charge up to line voltage as soon as power is applied. There are some other like fusible resistors like this one here which is not not uh, open. But we should have at least the, 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 a bare minimum the main filter for the standby supply which I think is this one over here and this is the standby transformer over there which gives us our, our uh, 5 volt supply. Our five, 5 volt all supply 
to power up the, the set itself. And it is a switch mode uh, regulator. There is a, an IC right down here for it. So it's rectified to DC, goes through this rectifier, or goes through this regulator IC into the, the chopper transformer. But I should have 160 volts or so across the, uh, the rectifier, and I don't. At all times, when there's power applied, I should have raw B plus across this cap, and I have like four volts. So something is preventing that. Could be a crack in the board, could be a connection. Let's do a close inspection. Upon a closer inspection, this power supply over here is a switch one. There's two relays here that switch on the main power supplies. That being one and the other one over here, or here. Uh, looks like this might be the standby, and that's the, that's the uh, the MOSFET driver for that standby supply. So, uh, because the standby is not working, nothing's going to turn on. So, I'm going to check some of these small caps down here in this oscillator circuit for the standby because that's likely where the fault is going to be is in the standby circuit. Um, could be the it could be this uh, IC as well that's gone bad, which is just basically a MOSFET. Right, Q840 is what they call that one. And it's a MOSFET, but it's, it's in an 8-bit or 8-pin dip. So let me just check some of these small caps here because one of these little small, like one microfarad caps goes open. That's typically the boot start, the bootstrap as they call it, that starts it up, that uh, gets the oscillator running. And if the oscillator's not running, obviously nothing else is going to run because we have no 5 volt supply. Okay, I'm going to do some live voltage testing. Or power the board up. I was looking for voltages on the filter capacitors and stuff for my standby voltage. So into the isolation transformer we go. I've taken my watch off obviously for safety and we have nothing. We have nothing on the filter cap there. We have nothing on the filter cap here. So that would explain why we have no. This is our standby supply here. We have nothing on the standby. We have nothing on the fuse going into the standby rectifier. We have lost voltage on this input. So now it's just a matter of seeing where we have lost voltage. So if I go over to AC side, we'll see that I have 119 volts here. I have 119 volts there. I have 119 volts here. Where else am I got to go from here? Just trace this through. I have 119 volts there. Comes up to here, 119 volts. I have 119 volts into the power relays. Uh, the LEDs would switch on when the set turns on, but the set's not turning on because we're not getting standby. So somewhere between here and over here on the standby rectifier, there's got to be a component that's open or a connection that's open uh, that's blocking that voltage. And that's what we're investigating now. It's kind of hard without a schematic. I'm just kind of tracing the um, copper traces by looking at them but I should have a I should have a standby voltage or a raw voltage on that filter cap which I don't at the very least I would have it on the uh, rectifier here right for the standby which I have nothing I should have something here on the primary whoops try it on the on DC side see so I have nothing I got one volt. That should be like 150. There is a fuse here, but it's not open. It's good. Somewhere along here, something's open. So tracing the electrons back, or the circuitry back, we end up here on a big resistor, uh, R850. If we look at the meter here, R850 is open. And that is this big resistor right here, which is a 1.8 ohm fusible resistor. So maybe something popped and took that out. We'll take that resistor out and uh, we'll check for shorts.
So this is 1.8 ohms, and as you can see, it's it's open, completely open. So there's where our power interruption is, but why? That's the question. So let me just check for shorts. Could be a blown MOSFET for that matter. I'll bring you guys along for a ride as I check the MOSFETs because I have not found any that are shorted yet. It could be the resistor itself just gave out, which is always a possibility. They, they do sometimes because they run hot. They do sometimes, uh, the wire does sometimes let go internally. Um, there's no, like there's no shorts. Like there's no shorts on the, on the, uh, the circuit. And check between ground and these relays here and see if any of those are shorted. Right, no shorts on any of these or to this other, other side here. goes to there that goes to the uh, to the rectifier and this other one here should go to this rectifier over here which it does but there's no shorts that's ground that's the hot side right but no shorts here so it may just be a bad resistor doesn't that doesn't happen very often but uh, they certainly they certainly can fail they certainly can fail so maybe just a failed resistor would not be interesting if that's all it was from the looks of the design, it looks like there used to be three resistors in series, and they've put jumpers in to jumper out two of them. So if you look at the if you look at the layout here, here's the one that was bad, right? And it goes to this one, which went through there, and then to there, and then from there to there. But there's a jumper been put across here. So there used to be at one time on the design of this, there used to be three resistors in series, and they changed it out for one single resistor. What we can do is take that resistor apart and just see if it, what it looks like inside. Is it just the wire that, that broke? We'll get some cutters and we'll cut that resistor open see what, what it looks like inside. Because it certainly doesn't look like uh, there's any other parts that are that are blown. So it may be just this resistor itself went bad. So I'm going to try to get this thing open without losing an eye to flying pieces of, of uh, ceramic. It's going to fly out of this thing when it when it cracks open. Okay, so what do we got inside here? Oh, we have a thermal fuse. Interesting. We have a thermal fuse with a resistor beside it. Well, what do you bet it's the thermal fuse that's gone open and not the resistor? I bet money on it that the resistor itself is fine, which it is, and it's the bloody thermal fuse. Okay, well, I think we can probably uh, do without the thermal fuse on this. But yeah, that's the thermal. This resistor's just gotten over the, the melting temperature of that thermal fuse, and over time it just let go. I got another one here that I pulled out of another chassis that I'm going to install in place of the one that was uh, popped. And we'll give this a try and see whether the TV turns on. My bet is that it will. Let's see. Get the new part in place. There we go. Solder that down and then we'll put the board back in and uh, give it a try and see whether it works. I bet that's all that was wrong with this is that uh, thermal cutout just over over time of just heating and cooling, heating and cooling. Uh, it let go is what I think happened on this one. And of course the power cord. Now, is it going to work or is it going to go boom? Let's try it out. 
Okay, I have a light. That's good. I have a backlight. And, of course, I don't have a picture. I don't have a source plugged into it. Input HDMI 2, HDMI 3, HD... Antenna cable, that's what I want, because that's what I've got hooked up to. Okay, let's see. Obviously, it's going to work. Let's just see whether I'll tune something in. Cable 4. Cable 2. Hey, look at that. Discovery Science Channel. Is there volume? Where's the volume on this thing? I would say that this is a success. So there's another one that we've saved from the uh, junk heap. One thermal cutout resistor. Failed on it. I wonder how many of these things went in the garbage for people not figuring that one out. That's the first time I've seen one of these fail. I'm going to get rid of this before I get in trouble. Whoops. What did I change to? Oh, I'll, just, I'll just change to something like that I can get away with like my security cameras. There we go. Okay, so we had a, um, a thermal cutout that went bad on this one. And that's all that failed. This was the remnants of the old piece that I pulled out of there. So basically what this is, is it's a thermal cutout with a resistor. And what happens with those thermal cutouts, people think that they fail for a reason. No, thermal cutouts fail for no reason whatsoever. They fail just from thermal stress over the years. With the constant heating and cooling, heating and cooling, heating and cooling, you have to understand how a thermal cutout is made. What makes up a thermal cutout? There's a spring with a piece of wire. One end of the spring is connected to one terminal. When the component gets hot, if it gets over a certain degrees, there's a special low melt solder that holds the wire to the end of the spring. And if the temperature exceeds the melting temperature of that low temperature alloy, be it 100 degrees Celsius, 150 degrees Celsius, Whatever the alloy temperature is, when it melts, the spring then pulls the connection apart and the thermal cutout is done. They're there for, to prevent a catastrophic failure if something's drawing too much current, but not drawing enough current to trip a fuse, but drawing enough current to overheat the resistor on the thermal cutout or the thermal fuse, or if it's, say, protecting a transformer or protecting some other type of component, if that component gets over a certain temperature, it will let go. In this case, it's a resistor. The resistor itself is going to get hot. That is just how resistors are. Resistors get hot. And what will happen is, even though it hasn't exceeded the maximum operating temperature, just through repeated heating, cooling, heating, cooling, eventually, if, especially if it's getting close to, if say it's rated at 98 degrees Celsius, but that temper that component runs at 80 all the time. That's the normal operating temperature of that resistor for the amount of current that's being drawn. Um, what will happen over time is it will stress that alloy and eventually it will break. And that's what happened on this one. So perfectly good TV would have gone in the garbage for a component that's only a couple dollars and a TV like this back in the day when we were repairing this sat like this would, would have probably been fixed for 150 bucks but today you can buy a new TV for not a lot more than that and when people call me out on this and tell me that they haven't seen TVs that cheap well I've just finished watching a bunch of Boxing Day ads for 65 inch 4k LED backlit TVs for $400, $479, name brand sets. So they are out there, they are cheap, and that's why people don't fix TVs. This one here, I'm gonna turn around now that this one's working. I don't have the remote for it, unfortunately, but this one here, I'll sell this one. You know, I'm, I'll probably get, I might get 50 bucks for it from somebody. You know, I'll ask $50 for something like this, and I might get it, uh, I might not, but this one here is working. 
the screen is not damaged like the other one that I worked on yesterday, which I ended up giving away just because the screen was damaged. This one here is a good set and it's probably good for many more years of use because it's a fluorescent backlit display as opposed to an LED display. And the fluorescent displays, they just go on forever. They're very stable, very reliable technology. The thing I should note on this one is it's, it's, it's bass ass words, as someone would say. Uh, you notice where the timing controller board is? It's up on the top on this. This set followed the, the, the Sony design, let's just say. When the LCD sets first came out, so I can see if, it, if it's a, there's a manufacturer of the panel on this. Who made it? Chinese-made panel, but um, this is something that Sony did, and others, a few others, did the same. But when the LCD TVs first came out, everyone had the timing controller on the bottom, and what the manufacturer started seeing, and I saw this when I was still in the business because the LCD TVs had just started hitting the market in the early 2000s when I left in 2003. And I had seen a few of these. People would go up to the TV and they were used to cleaning their old TV by spraying Windex all over it and so forth. Well, they would spray Windex on their flat panel TVs to get their kids' grubby fingerprints off of it. And the Windex would run down the display into the front and it would get on the tabs that were in the front and burn them out and ruin the panel. So Sony and other companies, obviously Toshiba did the same thing, decided, well, let's just flip the panel over so that if they spray something onto the screen, it'll just run down into the front and won't hurt anything. Hence the T-Con board and all the tabs are up on the top. That seemed like a really good idea, but it wasn't because panels started failing when the ICs got cooked by the fluorescent backlights because these get quite hot. So they ended up with cooked ICs, not all of them, but there was a lot of them that got cooked. So they reverted to putting the panels the other way again because heat rises. And of course now everything, the panel, the, the ICs are always on the bottom on the, on the newer ones. But uh, there was a period of time in the late 2000s, mid to late 2000s, where they went to this design because, because of people spraying the screens with liquid and uh, causing short circuits. So I figured I would just show you that and explain a little bit of the history of why they did this and why they went back to the other one after the fact. So anyway, that was uh, the one that was bad right there. That's the one I swapped out. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.